welcome back to our learning course. In this lesson, we will go over a learning finding called overshadowing. We will see that it is a simple phenomenon, but it tells us something important about learning, that animals must choose what to learn about. We will see what this means by going over a few examples of overshadowing from papers published by Kehoe, Forey, and Lolordo, Cook, and Mineka, and Leising and colleagues. Let's first explain what we mean by overshadowing, then we will see why it's important. In an overshadowing experiment, a response is trained to stimuli A and B, presented together. After training, A and B are tested separately, and it is found that responding to A and B differs. In our usual notation, the overshadowing experiment is a training phase with A, B plus, and then a test with A and B separately. Or if we want to use cuter symbols, we can have, for example, a sound and a light followed by food, symbolized by the usual pizza slice, and then at the test, the bell and the light are presented separately. In a classic experiment, Keo conditioned rabbits to blink to a compound of a light A and a tone B. For some rabbits, the tone was soft, for others, medium, and for others, yet loud. You can review the lesson on Pavlovian preparations if you don't know about the eye blink conditioning procedure. As we just mentioned, the light and tone were always together during training, but then they were tested separately to see what the rabbits would do to each stimulus on its own. The question is, did the rabbits blink more to the light or more to the tone? The results are in this graph. Remember that there were three groups of rabbits. The white bars tell us how often they blink when they heard the tone. The black bars, how often they blinked when they saw the light. Let's start from the left. This is the group of rabbits trained with the soft tone. This tone's loudness was 85 decibels. This is still quite loud, like a hair dryer or a blender going. Rabbits in this group, as we can see, responded approximately equally to the tone and the light blinking about 90-95% of the time to each. They did not show more learning for either. In the other two groups, however, the rabbits blink more to the tone than to the light, and more so the louder the tone. Just to have an idea, 93 decibels is about the loudness of a loud subway train approaching. The rabbits trained with the 93 decibel tone blink to the light less than 40% of the time. We say that the medium and loud tones overshadowed the light, that is, that the animals preferred to learn about one stimulus, the tone, over the other, the light. The experiment we just discussed was a Pavlovian conditioning one, but we find overshadowing also in instrumental conditioning. In this example, Fauré and Lolordo trained pigeons to press the lever in response to a light and sound presented together. In one kind of training, pressing earned food, in another, it avoided the shock. The pigeons were then shown the light and the sound separately. Did they press more to one or to the other? Did this vary across conditions? The results are in this graph. When pressing earned food, the pigeons responded more, much more to the light and almost nothing to the tone. On the other hand, when pressing avoided the shock, the pigeons responded much more evenly with some preference for the tone. Now that we have seen two examples, let's see why overshadowing is so interesting. We might have expected that animals should have no reason to learn about one stimulus or the other. In fact, because the stimulus are always shown together, their consequences are exactly the same. However, overshadowing shows that often animals learn more about some stimuli than others. For example, more about visual than sound stimuli. In this case, we say that learning is biased. A good guess about these biases is that they make sense in the animal's natural environment. We can appreciate this better by looking at two more examples. Cook and Mineka had rhesus macaques watch other macaques get scared in front of a snake and a flower bouquet. This is a now classical experiment in the social learning of fear. Social learning refers to the fact that often animals learn from what they see other animals doing. In this case, Monkeys were learning what to be afraid of. Our question is, what did the watching monkeys become afraid of, the snake or the flowers? If you think that it would be curious to become afraid of flowers, then the monkey would agree with you. 
they became quite afraid of the snake, but not at all of the flowers. This is shown in this graph, where fear behaviors refers to various things that scared monkeys do, like baring their teeth, staring at the fearsome object, or trying to get away from it. As you see, there were approximately 10 times more fear behaviors in response to the snake than in response to the flowers. This is a fairly extreme case of overshadowing. It seems that the monkeys, even if they don't innately fear snakes, can learn this fear very quickly. There seems to be something that tells them that it is more appropriate to be afraid of snakes than of flowers. Let's look at the last example, a study by Lysing, Garlic, and Blaisdell. In this study, pigeons had to learn which location to pack to get food, among eight possible locations. Two locations were never used, so I did not draw them here. The goal location was unmarked, but it could be inferred based on landmark stimuli. During training, there were two conditions. One condition showed two stimuli, here shown as a square and a circle. In this case, the pigeon had to pack the location immediately to the right of the circle, with a, marked here with a check mark. The other condition showed the third stimulus, here shown as a cross. In this case, the correct location was two steps to the right. After learning this task, the pigeons were given four kinds of test trials. In the first two kinds, the circle and square were presented separately. The pigeons found the goal more than 80% of the time when shown the circle, but less than 20% of the time when shown the square. In other words, the stimulus closer to the goal overshadowed the other one that was further away. To find the goal, the pigeon were relying on the circle much more on, than on the square. The other two kinds of test trials were used to control for possible confounds. First, the pigeons could have made more mistakes with the square simply because it was further away from the goal. The cross, however, was also two steps away from its corresponding goal location, and the pigeons did much better with the cross than with the square. The cross was also tested together with the stimulus, here shown as a star, that had not been used at all in training. The pigeons did well on this test. This means that just seeing two stimuli is not confusing to them. In conclusion, it seems that the pigeons learning about the circle more than about the square was really overshadowing. That is a learning bias that leads to learning about one stimulus more than about another, even when the stimuli contain the same information about how to behave. We can now see that overshadowing experiments tell us that animals have preferences, which we often call biases, in what to learn about. Let's take a step back and see why these preferences might exist. The natural environment is much messier than the laboratory. There isn't just the light and the sound, but countless stimuli an animal could learn about. Compare, for example, a pigeon that only sees the light and the sound in the lab, and a pigeon in the wild, who sees and hears many other pigeons, other animals, and many other objects. You may remember one of the first lessons in which I said that behavior often depends on both learned and genetic information. Overshadowing is a perfect example. In that lesson, I also said that learning has evolved so that the animal can gather knowledge about its environment that the genes cannot possibly have. Another side of the coin is that when the genes do have some knowledge, they might try to pass it on to the learning system, so to speak, and help animals learn about the right things, even in a messy situation. Let's see if this makes sense by going over the examples of overshadowing that we have seen. The monkey experiment is clearest in this sense. It is easy to see that snakes are more dangerous than flowers. If monkeys had no genetic information on how to learn about danger, the sight of a scared monkey would result in fearing the flowers as much as the snake, which would make little sense. The landmark experiment is also easy to interpret this way, as landmarks that are closer to a goal are generally more reliable than landmarks further away. The results of the other two experiments are not as obvious, but we can still make good guesses as to why animals showed certain biases. For example, pigeons use vision to find food primarily, so it makes sense that they learn more readily about visual than sound stimuli when learning to press a lever for food. When avoiding danger, which was a shock in the experiment, on the other hand, both sights and sounds can be helpful, and in fact there was no great difference in that case. For the rabbit eye blink study, we can note that the function of the eye blink is to protect the eye. 
If the danger is mostly flying insects, then it makes sense to learn more about sounds than about sight, like the sound of buzzing bee or fly. What have we learned from these experiments with monkeys, rabbits, and pigeons? In any situation, animals could learn about many different stimuli, but some of these will be more useful than others. Sometimes the genes are able to provide some information on what to learn about, and in laboratory experiments, this information shows up as learning biases. People have learning biases too. For example, when we get food poisoning, we develop an aversion for the food we ate, but not for the friends we ate it with. In this case, food overshadows friends. Here are my suggestions for some related lessons. The Raskol and Wagner model is a major theory of learning that, among other things, helps us understand exactly why overshadowing happens. The lesson on genetic guidance of learning puts overshadowing in the broader context of how genes can help animals to learn efficiently. This lesson is over. Happy learning to everyone.